Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel, I'm an airline pilot and today we are going to fly the brand new Fokker F28 from Just Flight. At the moment I'm starting this live stream. It is still a pre-release version but release is forecast today and hopefully within the next couple of hours if we look at the UK business hours. But we'll see about that. For those of you who don't know, Just Flight is located in the United Kingdom. So most likely I would expect or hope for a release within UK business hours, which is round about until 1700 UTC. All right then, let's have a look into what we are going to do today. So we are currently standing at Bremen Airport in northern Germany and we will fly this one down to Venice in northern Italy. This promises to be a lovely one hour and 30 minute flight where we can explore the airplane to the deepest. Now, having a look into a couple of the airplane's specialties, why don't we go over some features at first? The Fokker 28 comes with four different versions, which are the Mark 1000, 2000, 3000 and 4000. And just flight have modeled pretty much every system there is in this aircraft, making it a true study level 1960s airliner, which is something that I'm really excited about since it is just something that we didn't have before in the story of Microsoft Flight Simulator. Alright, obviously the Fokker 28 is a 1960s plane and therefore has a 1960s navigation suit, but how you can navigate with that? I have a separate tutorial series coming up for that over the next couple of days and then absolutely I'm going to show you in this live stream as well. Okay then, how about we start with the walk around. We are sitting here on the apron in a livery that I'm sure many Germans will still know about but I don't have to turn the camera for those of you. I'm sure all of you still know LTU. And LTU actually flew the plane for approximately four years between 1969 and 1973, 1974 when they were phased out and sold to other airlines mostly in Indonesia. Alright, how about we start with the walk around and we are starting of course where else at the um, main door. We can see that the um, textures are a little bit unsharp when we get very close up but as soon as you're at a reasonable distance like now the textures are looking very very good. So, overall, my impression of the model is really good, but how about I just stop talking about it and go ahead and show you about it. So, if we go down to the nose wheel well, something that you would barely get into, you can see that even here there is some detail in there. Could be a little bit more detailed, I'm pretty sure there would be something up here in the real plane, but you get where this is going, this is actually looking quite alright. One thing that, however, caught my attention is that look of the uh, side of the front tire over here, which looks a little bit, I don't know, I just haven't seen any tire look like that in a very long time. In any case, we can see that the model is done with a very good detail and we can see that they got some good texturing on it here as well. Okay then, going forward to the front of the airplane once again, we got the retractable taxi lights up here, which actually do extend, and we've got the air inlet flaps, and then we can go a little bit further ahead. We've got the uh, probes on the FO side, the service door, which is something that I'm actually going to go into in a little bit more detail when we take the tour of the cabin in a few moments. But in the meantime, let's have a look into some of the um, probes up front. Particularly I found this um, static probe here quite interesting with the paint bleeding off over here and then you've got the text below that static ports primer only do not repaint area within the red line and at the same time we got some of the uh, paint coming off over here which looks quite cool I have to say but I would be a little bit worried about my static port giving me an incorrect indication then due to the airflow being possibly disrupted by the paint peeling off. But then again, that is something that maintenance would take care of. If I would find an airplane like this, I would absolutely call the engineers, tell them to have a look at it, and they could then determine if it's um, necessary to fix this or not. Going up front to the leading edges of the wing, we can see good texture detail around. Again, when you come very close, it starts getting blurry, like over here. But when you look at it from a reasonable distance like this, 
then it's looking pretty, pretty cool. So that is about the level of detail to which the airframe is done. Also, always something I like to look at is the um, construction of the lights over here in the wing. And it's good to see that they put some 3D detail in there as well. Also got some static discharges here. And then obviously we've got the aileron, the flaps. And just look at those huge um, flap fairings here in the back. Speaking for quite a big motor in there. Finally, let's have a look at the engines. We've got Rolls-Royce engines in here. And contrary to what we know from a lot of our different aircraft, what we can see over here is engines that are actually not turbofans, but turbojets. What does it mean? Well, basically, if we have a look into the front of the engine, then we'll see that there is no bypass over here. So the entire air that's being sucked into the engine is going straight into the engine core. And well, that is how early jet engines look like, but it also is a little bit inefficient. So obviously, 1969, what else do I have to say? What is interesting though, something that we barely see in jet engines these days, is that these engines do not start with a fan, but actually with a set of inlet guide vanes and um, stators. So the part you see in the front over here is actually static and is not rotating. But the actual first stage of the low pressure compressor that is rotating is located behind it. That's the one that has these um, connections between the blades. The front over here is a static part that simply guides the air onto the low pressure compressor correctly. And that is actually modeled and I'm sure it is something that will be asked a lot as to is this a bug? No it's not, it actually a feature. So going on then we've got the APU exhaust down here with a little bit of um, remains, let's call it like that. But what's really interesting about this plane is the speed brake, and that is what we see on the tail cone section over here. And the speed brake is actually opening in a V-shape. So if you look at it from behind, it's opening to the sides, pretty much like what we're used to from the BAU 146. And I do really find that quite cool. However, we still have lift dumpers on the wings, um, which you can see over here. But those are, as they say, lift dumpers, and you really don't want those out in flight. Right, the other engine, not too much to say about that, but something I do want to have a look at on this side of the wing is the main landing gear. So first of all, we got the chocks in place here, which do feature some nice models, but also the main landing gear is done to really good um, quality standard. What would be nice would be a couple more of insects, and stuff like that on the front over here because that's what the front part of landing gears notoriously looks like. But then again, they probably just clean the airplane before um, they release it to us. Also good detail over there in the landing gear retraction mechanism. At least as far as we can see because we can really not see that much of it. Another interesting feature of the Fokker wings. Well, first of all we've got the um, retractable landing lights out there. But then let's go ahead to the really interesting part, that's what we see over here. So first of all we got the wingtip fences, which is an indication that Fokker during the development of the airplane really struggled with it and struggled with the um, airflow on it. And then next up to it we've got the different sweep angles of the wings that we can see over here, which is once again an indication that aerodynamically they had quite a job to do with this airplane. However, all of that apart, I really have to say that it does fly very, very nice. Can only hope that that actually matches the um, real airplane, but I never flew Fokker. However, it does certainly feel believable. So how about we go ahead and head inside then so that I can so show you some more of the details. By the way, since I keep getting asked, this is my drone settings for my walk around. So drone speed somewhere between 3 and 5, and the rotation speed around 45. That usually works quite well for me. Okay, so this is where I normally uh, start my cockpit view and we can head right into the cabin. Now, as you can see, we've actually got a jetway over here 
on this gate position and I want to show you how you can use that with a Fokker. Because, well, obviously we got those uh, stairs up here, but look at that. You can actually fold them down and extend this little plate over here, over the bottom. And I find it really nice that they actually sent a jetway command together with that. So, cabin attendant station, fully modeled, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, because we first of all need to power up the airplane, and that's what we're going to do first. By the way, guys, thank you very much for being here, and thank you for joining the live stream. Um, I'm going to answer all your questions in flight, and then I'll also talk a little bit about my ongoing typewriting, so that is certainly going to come. But in the meantime, let's go ahead as... Um, Let's go ahead over here. And Ronald, regarding your question, if I would classify the BAE 146 as study level as well. Um, not really, because the 146 um, just has that FMC stuff and so on. So you can really see they made something up over there. While in this plane, well, it has a GNS 530, but that is actually, you know, imaginable to be in a plane like this. All right, so there's two easy ways of how we can power the airplane up. One of them is the APU, the other is the ground power. For this one, at least while I'm showing you around the cabin, let's go ahead and use the ground power, which we can get from the aircraft menu and then press the ground power button, which is going to connect the um, ground power unit. All right, powering it up, just listen to those sounds. Just Flight actually managed to find a real Fokker from which they recorded all the sounds. That is quite amazing if you ask me, seeing that these planes are phased out since like 25 years or so. And it is really, really neat that they uh, managed to do this. Alright, let's have a very quick look through the cabin. We're sitting in the Mark 1000 model right now, which has 65 passenger seats. And those 65 seats are split in a 2 to 3 configuration. But let's have a look into some of the level of detail that we can find within the cabin area. So first of all, we'll start along the standard passenger seats. You can see good texture quality on the walls, on the windows, and also on the seats with a very nice level of detail over here. I mean, just look at that. That's really close up and still looking very, very good. So very well done job on the cabin. Same going down here, we've got our um, got our seat belts and the floor area is looking good as well so this is looking absolutely stunning I have to say also on the top the passenger service unit well we cannot activate any of the reading lights but I guess that would be asking a little bit too much wouldn't it what we can however activate is the cabin attendant station and I'm going to show you a couple features of that right now so we can find the cabin attendant panel right here at the front and as part of the pre-flight checks, the cabin crew would go over all the functionality over here. Starting with the functionality of the lights, like so. And now I'm just going top to bottom in no particular order. Well, for the, for the PAs, we don't want to do any PA right now, so for that reason, those are not really of our interest. But look at the pilot call. You've got the call button up here in the cockpit. If I'm pressing this one... You can see that see this actually illuminates the cabin crew call button. Obviously we can reset this and then it is going to extinguish the light in the cockpit as well. The same works the other way around. If the pilot calls the cabin crew, I can press that button over here and you've got the pilot call button located over here on the forward attendant panel. So if I do this, you can see the light comes on. Obviously we can reset this as well. The same goes for the cabin call, since there is a second cabin crew station at the back of the cabin. And then obviously you have the um, toilets over here as well. Because, well, many people don't know it, but there are actually emergency buttons in the um, toilets. So that if a passenger collapses there, they can call a cabin crew for it. Okay, then let's have a look into the... Further functionality, we've got the temperature control, which can be delegated to the cabin from the cockpit. For now we just remain, we've got the auto button, where you can set it with this um, dial over here. And then you can manually select it to hot or cold, 
and that actually works and can be seen working on the dials up there in the cockpit. Finally, we've got our boarding music that we can turn on like this. But for now, thank you very much for that. So that is the upper part. Then we can go on to the lower part. And over here we can control the cabin lights. So right now, all the cabin lights are turned off. How about we turn on the back? We turn on the front. And then we can turn on the lights for the front galley over here as well. Okay, with that done, we obviously need to check the emergency lights, which we got down here. Now you can see we've got the emergency exit lights and the overwing exit lights illuminated. And the same obviously goes for the two lights in the front up here as well. So somebody said circuit breakers in the video commentary and well, how about this? There are your circuit breakers, my friend. However, quick comment on circuit breakers as I may. Um, Regix said, in my opinion, study level should always include full circuit breaker and failure simulation as non-normal and emergency ops are a big part of simulator studying. I do agree with that. Um, however, do take into account that the circuit breakers are basically not touched by the pilot. In my old airline, we were allowed to reset them once if safety would be compromised if we didn't. In my new airline, we aren't allowed to reset them at all. And indeed, if you look into the A330 cockpit, then you won't even find any of them in the cockpit because they're all located in the avionics bay below. So, circuit breakers, I tell you honestly, um, what do you need them for? Even in the 737, I never had one pop in flight. I had, I think, one pop on the ground. And I had a few cases where the external power dropped out and where the pre-recorded announcement machine didn't work. And, well, I'll tell you what. Maintenance told us, yeah, don't touch it, we're coming. And then they reset a circuit breaker. So, circuit breakers, in my opinion, well, I don't know what everybody finds so, um... I don't know what everybody finds so, uh, important about them. What I do find a lot more important than a circuit breaker, however, is a working service door. And now look at that. The circuit break, uh, the service door actually opens upwards in the F-28. Now that's quite cool, isn't it? Can't go outside, but that is probably better the way it is. And well, I'm just going to keep this open for a little while because it is quite hot outside, 23 degrees, and you can't imagine how quickly aircraft become hot inside. So, want a hot cup of tea? Or maybe turn on the work lights in the galley? You can do that. All right, and that is basically the um, cabin attendant part in the Fokker. Now, I have to say that with everything simulated in here, I'm a little bit surprised that we cannot check the emergency equipment below the jump seat or fold the jump seat down. That would be like, well, I would kind of have expected that, but okay. We're going to keep the door open until we start passenger boarding. But basically, with what we have checked right now, the cabin of course still needs to be um, checked for anything that's not supposed to be there but apart from that our pre-flight checks are done and we can head over into the cockpit so welcome to the cockpit of the Fokker 28 so how about we are going to check how about we are going to check first of all the circuit break is back here and now these are actually not simulated so, we've got the circuit breakers in the galley and on the forward antenna panel, but here in the cockpit we cannot handle any of those. But then, once again, in my opinion, absolutely not needed because, well, in five years of flying a 737 I just never had to use one. And in the A330 I don't even have them anymore in the cockpit. So, tell me something about the importance of circuit breakers then. At least that's my personal opinion. I know that for some others they are nice to have. And I do agree on the commentary regarding failure simulation. And failures may be a good point to talk about with a Fokker as well. So, right now, as it is about to be released, 
the airplane does not have a failure simulation. However, it is going to be added later on. So th they said that they are certainly going to add failures in the aftermath, but the initial release version doesn't have them. However, let me point out at the same time, I did like seven or eight flights with the airplane now, and so far I really couldn't find any system that did not work properly. So we're going to see it during the course of the flight, but as far as I could see, really all of those systems did do a fine job and did seem to do what they were supposed to do. Would be interesting to play around with what would happen if you would, for example, manually try to open an outflow valve or so. But um, honestly, we'll see about that. We'll see about that. In any case, I would say that is about how this cockpit looks like. There is a ton of different light switches in here. Maybe we'll find a bit of time towards the end of the live stream where I'll show you some of those. In the meantime, how about we have a look at something that many of you are still missing elsewhere. You get what I'm talking about. Oh, electronic flight bag. You see us on the first page here already, which is the airplane setup. However, before I'm starting with this, I just quickly want to have over into the OFP page, because this is where I can import my Simbri flight plan. Now, ignore those little error messages up there. I still have the pre-release beta version of this. So by the time this gets out, this is probably all known and will hopefully all be fixed. Okay, so then. This is our basic route summary. We have a session type here where we can import the Simbri flight plan. And this is what our Simbri flight plan looks like. We're going from Bremen towards Venice as LTU flight 140 which is a chartered flight. We're planned at cruising level 310, the airplane can go up to level 350, and at least when you're at heavy weights, you really shouldn't try to get it above level 300 though. But um, today we're at a mediumish weight, so 310 looks to be a good cruising level. Since today there is a Simbrief profile available for the Fokker 28, they added that one overnight, so you can actually do full flight planning with it. However, be aware that by default Simbrief is always going to suggest RNAV routings to you, so if you want to fly with conventional navigation like we are going to do today, then you will have to come up with your own routes. But that is just for you to be aware of and uh, something to keep in mind. Alright, going on then, we have our Matars, which come directly out of Simbrief. We got the um, Matar over here, over in Bremen, 240 with 16, 10 kilometers, fuel 3600, 23 degrees QNH, 1010, and we got some temporary gusts and CBs in the area. And then going towards our destination, the wind is slightly variable between 080 and 140 at 7 knots, which is a good indication for runway 04 to be in use. 30 degrees QNH 1015. I was too lazy to plan an alternate, for that reason we do not have any information down here. Then going down to the output page, that is basically where our operational flight plan is located. I choose the Ryanair layout for this one, because it actually works very well for flying with conventional navigation. So if we go down here into the nav log, we can see that Ryanair includes stuff like VOR names, VOR frequencies, you got the tracks over here and everything, so really good layout for flying the Fokker. Okay then, let's get a bit more serious about our flight and start with a little bit of preparations then. Oh. Next up, we got the map, which is, well, a map. But this is just a normal street map, this is not an aviation map. However, if we go to the chart package, over here we got our aviation charts from Navigraph. At this point, by the way, thank you for Navigraph for sponsoring my charts in this video. Okay, so, we click on departure or arrival, and then we'd have the alternate over here as well. Today we have none, so that's the reason it indicates that. But for our departure, let's go ahead and collect a couple of uh, charts. So we want taxi charts, parking charts, and then obviously our standard instrument departure, which is going to be the Nienburg 5 Zulu today. You can see nice little conventional departure over here. And um, how to fly that? I just released a tutorial for um, the departure in the tutorial flight I'm going to do. But for this one, I'll talk you over it a little bit later as well. That is our charts. 
Next up, we got the app the um, aircraft page and over here you can see when we imported a Simbrief flight plan then we can also import the Simbrief payload and that's what I'm going to do. So we've got 56 passengers up here, we've got an automatic load of cargo giving us zero fuel weight like this and it automatically pre-selects the fuel as well. In terms of the fuel I just want to carry a little bit more because who knows what we might encounter throughout the flight. So I'm just going to load up a little bit of uh, extra fuel on this one. Like so. Santa tank we don't need today and um, that means we have almost full wing tanks. Apart from that we also have the options menus up here so for example currently you can see I fitted a standard vertical speed indicator over here but you could also go ahead and fit one that is um, equipped with a TCAS which might come in very handy for flying online on uh, Vatsim. Apart from that, we got things like synchronize the left and right altimeter. We got pilot callouts, which we will make use of during the flight. Cabin announcements, same thing. This particular aircraft is not fitted with a logo light. They did include accurate airline configurations with each of the liveries that's included in the package. Right then, flip chart options, gauge refresh rate, that kind of stuff. What is interesting here for you guys is the GPS navigation. So you can see by default we got a weather radar in here which however is inoperative. It is not going to show you any actual weather because of the limiting flight simulator API. Well familiar with that. But you can exchange that with a GNS 530 unit which then obviously would be able to um, do a bit more modern navigation. Personally though I'm going to keep this airplane on the conventional stuff because I just find it a lot more interesting to fly it like this. Cabin ambient sounds, rudder axis steering, HF aerial antennas, GPWS callouts, automatic cabin crew, that is a very nice feature by the way, I'm going to show you later on, are the different options that we have available. From there on we also got the notes, you can simply write something down over here, for example you might calculate your vertical profile which would be really interesting and really useful as well, but we'll get to that a little bit later on. So, in the bottom over here we've got our checklists, which actually include pretty much the entire normal procedures. Something that I unfortunately have to say once more is that, once again, a developer is confusing flows and checklists, because these are flows. These are the entire normal procedures, and not checklists, which you would use to check the most important safety features after you've done the flows. However, nonetheless, it means that you can learn to fly the airplane straight out of the box from your um, tablet without having to use a separate manual. Separate manual, by the way, is something that I do absolutely love about the Fokker because they have once again included a very detailed manual that you can see over here. 250 pages that includes everything from normal operations to systems information to when we go all the way down to the bottom the correct flows and everything we need for our departure as you can see over here this is the um, short checklist then we've got long checklists you can download the manuals from the just fly product page to have a look at them even before you have to buy the product so really good thing there that i can absolutely recommend you to have a look at what i also really appreciate down here is the flow patterns so for example here we've got our takeoff flow that we might use then going further down we have the same stuff for the approach and for the ILS for visual approaches as you can see down here pretty much for everything. Very comprehensive manual I am very very happy that we actually have this as it really makes us as it really puts us into a position where we can learn to fly the airplane properly. So um I'm going to go a little bit over some of the stuff in the manual later on. For now the important thing is that we know that it is there and that we know that we can find the thrust index table in there. And we are going to work with the thrust index table a little bit later on as I see some of you are asking already. And Michael in the comments, I can't help but giggle every time he says Fokker, sounds like a rude word. Well, believe it or not, my first video on the plane when I uploaded it and YouTube 
ran its algorithms over it, it actually demonetized the video because it accused me of using rude words within the first so many seconds, I don't know, where you are not allowed to use rude words when you monetize a video. So, just saying that. All right, so, um, that much about artificial intelligence, huh? Anyway, finishing up with the electronic flight pad, we got the top of his hand calculator. Handy little tool, however, I prefer to do it in my head. I'm going to show you how. And then finally, we've got some settings where we can do some uh, basic stuff like changing the brightness and so on. And that's basically our electronic flight bag. You can hide it and show it through the um, hidden click spot on the air vent over here. So if you prefer to use your personal tablet, then you can do that as well. And on the same side, you can put it on the FO side and so on. So. Whatever floats your boat, you can put the tablet wherever you want, except for the 737. Alright then, and with that, our tour around the cockpit is actually done. And I'm actually quite surprised to see that 70 of you guys are still here, even though I've just been talking and showing you the airplane for uh, half an hour without even moving it whatsoever. So, now let's actually go ahead and fly the airplane. I have a detailed tutorial series coming up over the next couple of days. For that reason, I'm going to keep this video a little bit more in the style of actually flying it than explaining how to fly it. But my tutorials will be there to teach you exactly how to fly the airplane over the course of the next, I don't know, one or two days. Alright then, so what do we need? We've actually loaded the airplane up already, so that is done. And I would say it is still pretty warm outside, probably around uh, 23 degrees, so how about we start up the APU. First thing for us to do is the APU fire test, so the switch is located down here and the APU fire switch is located up here. It is pullable by the way, I'm not going to try it, I don't want to uh, do a trust lead and external air start on my very first flight, but let's run the fire test, okay, worked fine. And with that, we can start the APU. Main switch on, 10 seconds for the flap to open, and then we can hit the starter. In the meantime, we can already switch one of the packs on, which is standard procedure, and since we have electric power, we can also put on the navigation lines. Alright then, 10 seconds are over, press the starter button, and we can see the APU is slowly lighting up. With the APU running, we should wait for about a minute before we're going to put on the generators or the um, APU air. So for that reason, I'm just going to continue with our cockpit scan flow. And for that, I would say we can actually go ahead and close that forward service door so that we can start boarding our passengers. So forward service door, close. Here we go. Okay, right back into the cockpit and we can start our boarding. In the meantime, APU is running, so let's continue with our scan flow. Generators are on, the emergency power is guarded, we've got the fast transfer is guarded, TRU is on, external power and batteries are on and the emergency exit lights are armed. And I'm also quickly going to turn on the signs already since we start our boarding. Then going up to the APU, this is running for a minute now, so generator can come online and I will turn the packs on now and just listen to the sound as I turn the packs on. All of it recorded from the real airplane. And it really shows, the immersion factor in this is absolutely amazing. So, engine master, uh, start master are off, then we can check our frequencies down here. The battery is showing good, more than 23. And the uh, AC meter selectors, we can use it on the external power or the generator number 3. Okay, cabin differential pressure obviously zero, field elevation zero as well, that's why the cabin elevation is showing the same. And then for the bleed air, it's all turned on except for that one since the APU is not capable of supplying cockpit and cabin at the same time. The temperature selector is 12 o'clock 
in the auto mode and with this is the switch that I talked about earlier that you could use to transfer the cabin control between the stewardess panel and the cockpit. By default in the guard position it's set to the cabin crew which you can see on the uh, steward position down there and uh, that means the cabin crew got full control of the cabin altitude. Coming down to the pressure controller we, we plan to cruise in 31,000 today and for that reason we are going to set a thousand more than that which is SOP so 32,000 is set down there and then we can go to the anti-ice panel which is set wing anti-ice off airfoil to the right side and the um, engine anti-ice off window heating set priority to the left we don't need to turn the heaters on with the outside temperatures above 20 degrees however I'm going to put them to low just because I know that otherwise I'm gonna forget Pedo heat off, coming down here the wipers are off and the seatbelt and no smoking signs are switched on. Leads us down to the left side, the alternate brakes are uh, in the full forward position. I could imagine these to be a pretty cool cup holder by the way. Talk about ways how to get fired from an airline. Okay, the north low steering switch is on, master warning panel tested and we keep it on the bright position. And then we move on to the main panel. We've got the um, any skip test that we can do down here. So we can test the outboard wheels and the uh, inboard wheels. Then moving up to the main panel. This is actually all for later, so don't worry about that. Then we move down to the um, hydraulics, which are actually all looking good. Hydraulic pressure 1,600 psi. That is actually the minimum pressure required, so we can keep it like that. However. Just to be on the safe side, I'm going to run the electric pump of system number one for a while to pressurize our brake system so that we can be sure we aren't accidentally um, rolling away. Like that. Okay then, engine fire warnings. Watch the um, fire light and the fuel switches and the um, fire handles come on as I press each of them. Like so. Or so. PVI test, we check that the um, vibration meters are going to come up as they do and we did the APU fire test already. Fuel gauge is down here, just more than 3000 in each tank, that is perfectly fine. A little bit less on the left tank since the APU is drawing fuel out of that, perfectly fine. Bring us down to the pedestal, we check that the fuel switches are shut, the cross feed is closed. Make sure that each one of the um, fuel booster pumps works, so we gotta turn them on and off one by one. Flaps are up and the alternate flap control is neutral and the alternate trim is neutral as well. And going down here we have our TTC and this is set into the takeoff mode, both of the switches. Winding and taxi lights all off naturally and on the right hand side we got the nav light on and that's it. Radio panel we want to transmit on VHF1, listen to both of them and we're going to do that on both sides. And then our radio will set 122.8 and 121.5. Now what's important when we get down to the radios over here is that we not only set the correct frequencies but in order to use the radios we also need to turn up the volume. Otherwise that stuff is not going to work. Okay, ADF, HF radio, we don't need those. On the autopilot panel we make sure that the um, pitch and roll switches are on. Release the gust block, very important. Otherwise, you are only going to get 80% of thrust and you can't move your flight control. And then moving on to the other side, we can switch our transponder into standby that it starts preheating. Master radio switch is coming on and the hydraulic system is on. Okay, perfect. So that is our airplane setup by itself complete. And Feldjäger, thank you very much for the 5 euro 99 donation. Thank you. Um, just translating your... Um, message to English there so that everyone can understand it. Thank you very much for your extraordinary quality of the videos and always have a good flight. Thank you so much my friend. Thank you so much. Then Regix, can I explain the TTC a bit more in detail um, later on when we are in flight, okay? So let's go ahead then and start our departure setup. For that we will need the charts. We are going to fly the Nienburg 5 Zulu departure today out of Bremen and for that we need 
let's have a quick look into the textual description. Climb straight ahead to 500, left turn, complete the turn within 1.3 dB Bravo November Delta, and then 198 track to 2.8 dB from uh, Bremen or 3.1 Bravo November Delta, turn left Nienburg Radio 311 inbound via Ibduck to Nienburg. So for the radio setup I'm going to do the following. We'll take Bravo November Delta 1365 on the number 2 radio. And since we want to use the DME, we've got to be sure to activate that as well. Same goes on the number one side. So 1365 in the number two. And then we will use Nienburg 16.5 in the number one for our first inbound track. So 16.5. In terms of the courses, we'll set the uh, heading back to the runway track. That's going to be 265. Pretty much like uh, so. And then we'll use our courses for this. So we got 131 in Nottingenburg. We can select that on course number one where we've tuned the VOR. 131. And then I'm going to use 198 on the course two just as a reminder of the track that we have to turn after this. So see how quick I forget it? Here we go 198. Come on. Sometimes jumping a little bit, that can be a bit annoying, but um, so be it. Flight director, we can prepare that as well. We're looking for 10 degrees nose up in heading mode, and the autopilot is going to remain off for now. So, initial climb clearance, according to the chart, is going to be 4,000 feet, as we can see down here. So, let's go ahead and select that in the altitude selector. 4,000. Finally, last thing. To prepare our flight instruments is to set the QNH. So departure QNH 1010. This is automatically synchronized with the other side as I have activated that option. So last thing in order to prepare for our departure is going to be on the um, little speed placard down here. And we are going to do flap 11 takeoff. So when I click on this, it automatically sets our speed box for the departure. And that's pretty much our navigation setup complete. So how about we go ahead and do a departure briefing then. Prep for the departure, well obviously not very familiar with the aircraft, so we are just going to take things slow. And if anything goes wrong, then in the worst case just take over. Just reminds me of the uh, golden rules of Airbus operations, I'm learning them at the moment, and obviously we have our um, fourth rule. If things don't go as expected, take over. And this is exactly what we're going to do. The autopilot doesn't do what we want it to do, most likely because I'm mishandling it, but you get where this is going. Then we will take over. So, let's have a look into our actual um, point of the flight then. We are parking on stand number 4 on the apron. It's going to be pushed back into November and then taxi out via November, Charlie and Foxtrot. And then we can taxi via Foxtrot all the way to the full length for runway 27. It's only 2,000 meters of runway, not too much. For that reason, we are not going to derate the takeoff. And we'll follow the Nienburg 5 Zulu departure straight ahead to 500 feet, then turn left within 1.3 dB from Bravo November Delta onto a heading of 198 until 3.1 dB Bravo November Delta, and then left on 131 inbound to Nienburg VOR. So, parts of the IFR profiles are within airspace class echo, watch out for VFR traffic, unknown to air traffic control. We will do that, and in order to limit the risk there, I am probably going to limit our airspeed to 220 knots below 10,000. And that is pretty much our departure proper briefing completed. So let's have a very quick look into the manual in order to determine the takeoff thrust for us today. And that is what I mentioned a little bit earlier with those thrust index tables. As I said, we are going to do a full thrust takeoff. So we've got to go into the um, manual down here. And now we look at this particular table. Our field elevation is zero. The outside temperature is 23. So let's take the 24 mark over here. Now we go to the side over here. You can see this is where it ends up. So we've got the um, thrust index of 170 over here, which we can use for our departure. So the thrust index 170, let's go ahead and 
get rid of the manual once again. And with that index, we can select it down here on the gauges, 170. And now on the takeoff run, if the needle indicates 100%, that is exactly our takeoff thrust set, thanks to the indexing system. Easy, isn't it? Also, while we're at it, let's put that weather radar in the standby, 5 degree tilt up. It's not working, but, you know, if we have it, then why not at least press the buttons. You can see I'm getting, I'm becoming an Airbus pilot, right? If I'm just talking about button pressing and stuff. Okay, anyway, that is pretty much our preparation completed. So, APU is still connected, but how about we go ahead and close our cabin doors now so that we can uh, start getting ready. So we are simply going to retract the panel down here and this is automatically going to send the command to remove the jetway from our aircraft. Neat, isn't it? I really like how they did this. And next up we're going to see the automatic cabin crew in action because just have a listen as I'm closing that door. So, closing this up, thank you very much, and then APU generator is running, okay, cockpit of ground, go ahead please, uh, please disconnect the external power and prepare the airplane for pushback, the parking brake is set, okay, ground power, gun, chocks, gun. So, just flight got their own little pushback tool delivered up here, which is uh, rather fancy, which I really like, I have to say. Um, then let's go ahead and run the B4 start procedures. There really isn't too much to do. We switch the engine start master on. We already have our bleed established. And then we can go down here. Fuel pumps. On for those tanks where there is fuel in there and finally the anti-collision light can go on and that is our procedure complete already got the master warning up here what's that hydraulic system number one and number two oil pressure well that is obviously associated with our current situation so let's go ahead and start our pushback from the outside everything is clear i didn't forget the chocks very well so we can go ahead and start our push. What I like in here are the different options that we have. Okay, brake release, that certainly helps with the push. So for example, we can influence the speed at which we are being pushed. Like here, four knots, two knots, whatever you like. And then you can also influence the steering angle. Well, the push, the animation doesn't seem entirely correct there, but you get where this is going. You get the idea. Oh, hello. Okay, if you're here already, start turning. bit stronger maybe 50% yeah that looks about right okay stop the push thank you brake set all right then I would say it is about time to go ahead with our engine start so once again just listen to the sounds as I'm engaging the starter The air conditioning system is shut down. We can see the high pressure spool coming up. This is similar to N2 on um, your favorite Boeing or Airbus aircraft. 15%. Fuel can go into the start position.
that's engine two start completed you could see how the electrical generator took over and how the air conditioning system came on again okay then starting engine number one HP increasing at 15 we turn on the fuel basically now and it is slowly coming up when the TGT is above 400 or the RPM above 50, we are going to push the uh, fuel lever all the way forward. Looks like TGT wins today. Yep. And that's two good engine starts. Clear disconnect, clear signal on the left hand side with a pin and have a good day. Bye bye. So the generators are on. Going to stop the APU. like so okay engine anti ice auto pedo valves on and then we can go ahead and extend the flaps flaps 11 and the lift dumpers are armed okay then one more check that the uh, gust lock is released which it is flight control check up down left right and the rudders left right okay and that's our after start procedures completed we've got a master warning here but nothing on the panel let's see the bulbs still work okay well canceling that left side clear right side clear and let's have a quick look into the charts So straight ahead, slightly right on a Charlie, left on a Foxtrot to the full length. Taxi light on. Park and brake off. And you only need a little bit of thrust, like this, in order to get the airplane taxiing. And once it's rolling, you can basically go back into idle. You see the airplane keeps rolling nicely, just like it should. And this is all with idle thrust now. Hey, clear on both sides. Okay then, looked good so far, so let's go ahead and do a very quick review of the takeoff briefing before we go. So takeoff speeds 128, 128, 137 means V2 plus 10 will be our initial panel 147 and flap retraction is just about there as well. So once we have completed the initial turn we can accelerate and retract the flaps but as per the flight manual we are going to keep the speed at v2 plus 10 and keep the um, flaps extended for our initial turn now our initial climb altitude here of 4000 might be a little bit low so um, we'll have to be a bit careful that we don't bust the initial climb but i have a feeling that our lovely unicom controller is going to give us the further climb clearance very very quickly once we're actually in the air so our routing if we have a look into the chart and that is really the most important thing about flying this aircraft we climb straight at and at 500 feet start the left hand turn onto 198 track to complete the turn within 1.3 db bravo november delta 
and that is what we have on our DME number two up here. And um, out of there, we are going to intercept the um, radio 311 into Nienburg VOR as um, per the chart. Okay, any questions? No? Very good. Then let's go ahead and prepare the airplane for departure. Now listen to this. Once the cabin crew is done, they actually come in, tell you that they're ready, and then close the door again. Nice little immersion feature, isn't it? Okay, clear on the left side, clear on the right side, and with that I would say we are ready to go. Okay, take off. Degrees of pitch works rather well. 500 feet, left hand turn. Flaps up. No, don't retract the flaps yet. So we're looking at a track of 198. Like this, and now we can start accelerating. So, flaps coming up. Set climb power. Okay, increasing thrust slightly for climb power. And then we can basically turn on the autopilot over here. So we've got 220 knots, speed hold, and let's get our further climb clearance. Activate the beam mode, which intercepts the radio towards Nienburg VOR. Okay, and with that, we are on the way. So, very quick look into the power settings here. We're looking at a TGT of maximum 470 degrees during the climb. And that is how much power we can add to get the TGT up to 470, which is just about here. Perfect. So, set standard. And a cross check, passing, five to, uh, passing level 6 1. Now, checked. Alright, and that is the entire secret behind getting this little beauty airborne. So let's go ahead, climb up to our cruising level, 310. Set. And uh, level 310 checked. So, right now I am mostly focusing on looking outside since we are flying through airspace class Echo. So. We are carefully checking that we are um, not flying into any VFR traffic out here and only once we're above 100 we can then go ahead and um, accelerate the airplane and so on. So Rishi, you should check out the exterior view jet blast, incredible sound. Well let's do that. This is loud. 
at night. And dirty. Okay, back to the cockpit. Well, that sound is really good. Good, very good suggestion there, Rishi. Okay, passing 100. Let's go to pitch hold and pitch it down a little bit. In order to pitch it around, I have assigned two buttons under my joystick. Normally the uh, lever is down here, but I'm operating this with my joystick, making it a lot easier. The instructions how to do so are located within the product manual, and I can absolutely recommend to check them out. So, target speed 270 knots. We'll let the plane accelerate until it reaches that, and then we'll put it back into speed hold mode. So, that's about 270. Speed hold. And here we go. As we climb up, we always need to have an eye on our cabin pressure. Keep in mind, it is a mostly manual system. And we also have to keep an eye on our TGT, making sure it doesn't increase too much. 470 is what we're looking for, but it's just about that little blue dot over here, but not much more. Pretty much like so. Two and a half thousand feet a minute climb rate. Looks quite good to me. Ice detected. Where is that ice coming from? Well, anyway, if it complains that we've got some ice on the airplane, let's turn on the engine anti-icing. What's the outside temperature? Yeah, okay. Minus five. That's fine. Okay, so, now that we are basically out of the uh, terminal area in Bremen, we need to start thinking about our en route navigation. And thinking about en route navigation, obviously the first thing for us is when are we going to be overhead Nienburg VOR? Because Nienburg actually is a pure VOR without a DME attached to it. So, as you can see on the chart, at Ipduck, we have 25 GME from Bremen. So at this point, let's go ahead and tune Bremen on nav number 2, 17.45. Like that. And that gives us Bremen over here. So we've actually overflown Ipduck already. And out of Ipduck, we have 9 miles towards Nienburg. So Nienburg is located at 34 GME from Bremen VOR. The next thing for us to take into account then is where are we going to fly next. And for that we no longer need this chart. But we actually need to go into the operational flight plan. And that's why I said the Ryanair plan is so cool. Out of Bremen VOR we are going to fly towards Leine 15.2. So we know that we are about 4 miles from Nienburg. So let's go ahead and pre-select liner 15.2 on radio number 2. Here we go, 15.2, and the course to go there is about 139. So let's pre-select that on the number 2 radio. If we want to know the exact course, we can look into the flight plan as well. This tells me Nienburg outbound 136. So 136 is going to be the course outbound Nienburg. You can see just now we got into the cone of silence, overhead Nienburg VOR. The autopilot reverted from the beam mode to the roll mode as it lost the signal. Now we've overflown the cone of silence. So I'm simply switching over to NAV2 and this is tuned for line of VOR now. So all I need to do is hit the beam button and then the airplane is going to fly us right towards line of VOR. So, quick check on the temperatures once more, 460, 460, sorry, 470 of course, that's looking good, so our current thrust is still looking good, and like that we can now continue our flight to the next VOR. 
since we no longer need the Nienburg VOR, we can go ahead and please Mac Nürnberg 1575 already on the other radio. So number two is in use right now. That means we can use the number one for our Nürnberg VOR 1575. Like this. We're probably not going to receive it yet. Indeed, you can see the um, receiver remains dead. And that is actually fully expected since we are still quite a bit away from Nürnberg. Oh, passing 20,000. I believe I forgot to uh, set the landing lights off earlier. Yes, I did. So let's do that now. And then I would say I do not expect any turbulence on the way out. So let's go ahead and release the seatbelts. And since we're flying a 1960s plane, also no, you know, smoking signs. Also, we should be out of the icing condition, so we can set the engine and guys back to the auto position. Okay, nice. And with that, we are pretty much en route. But it's always good to have a look into your engines, because the temperatures can change, for example, when turning the anti-ice on and off. So for that reason, let's bring them back to the 470 degrees that we're looking for, for a good amount of climb thrust. So, oh, passing flight level 220, radar climb is somewhere around 1500, doing 270 knots. And if we check the manual, we will find that the that a good intermediate climb speed is 270 knots until you convert to Mach 0.65. For the best rate of climb, you do 250 and Mach 0.6. And for a high speed climb, you can do 320 and Mach 0.725. However, the good compromise that the airplane is normally operated at is 270 knots and Mach 0.65. Now, we do not have a Mach hold mode in this airplane. As you can see, our vertical modes are pitch, height, speed and glide slope. So for that reason, once we convert from flying a constant indicated airspeed to a constant Mach number, we have to switch the ES mode off and turn into pitch mode and then we have to kind of keep an eye on our Mach number ourselves. So it certainly is an airplane that is going to keep us busy flying, but you will see in a few moments that it is actually not too hard. So a very quick look into the cabin pressurization. We can see our target cabin pressure is uh, seven, sorry, 6,500 feet. The cabin is now at uh, 3,500. 7 PSI differential and climbing at 300 feet a minute. That's nice. We just got to keep an eye on the cabin differential pressure here to make sure that we do not exceed the limit. So we might have to adjust the rate manually in order to adapt to um, a good rate of climb that we're doing at the moment. All right, so Then, I would say, from now on, things get a little bit more relaxed. Converting on the Mach number right now, this is 0.65. So let's go to pitch hold and get it up a little bit. And we're also overflying liner VOR at the moment, and we should leave it on an outbound course of 161. So let's go ahead, heading, heading. We're looking at about 161, like so. We can select the course to 161 as well. Okay. So, here's a little trick for you. When you are intercepting a radio, when you're overflying something, do not use the beam mode but much rather use heading mode in order to intercept it slowly and only when you're actually on the radial use the beam mode. That is going to avoid your airplane aggressively banking left and right, making your life a lot easier. Now, as you can see, we converted to pitch mode and I increased the pitch slightly now climbing on Mach 0.64, so let's uh, tell it pitch down a tiny bit there. 
just to be sure that we get back to Mark 0.65 and don't get too slow. But you can see where this is going. Maybe 5 degrees further to the right in order to make sure that we intercept the uh, radial correctly here. Quick check of the cabin pressure. You can see the differential is slowly getting towards the limit. But then again we are not climbing very um, quick anymore either. So I don't think cabin pressure is going to be a problem. So the radial starts coming in. And I'm simply going to leave the airplane in the heading mode until the radial is almost centered and only then I'm going to switch to beam mode and that is going to make our tracking of the VOR nice and smooth. Alright, once we reach cruising altitude we're going to have another look into the cabin see what that looks like in flight and um, That's basically it. Okay, so we are back at Mach 0.65, climbing up nicely, 1,200 feet a minute, and we only got like 2,500 to go, so we are almost in cruising level. If you guys have any questions about the airplane, then um, now is the point to uh, ask them, because once we're in cruise, and once we have nicely settled into the cruise, I can take the... Um, possibility and the chance to answer your questions to the best of my abilities. So, a very quick check across our panel. I don't want to be on. That's the altitude function of the transponder. That should actually be on, of course. Okay, Mark 0.65. Maybe we can climb a little bit faster. Again, I'm using the um, pitch dial that we have down here. That one. To command the airplane pitch. In order to maintain my uh, mark number here in the climb. Also, we are slowly but steadily intercepting the radial. I'm simply keeping my heading over here until it is centered. And then I'll switch to beam mode. So, one to go. Let's limit the vertical speed to 1,000 feet a minute, and as we do that, we let the plane accelerate. Our cruise Mach number is going to be 0.7, so I've pre-selected the speed bug to Mach 0.7. And now the um, VOR is coming pretty much centered. So let's go ahead, press the beam button, and now the airplane is automatically intercepting the radio. And isn't that a smooth intercept? As we're exactly on it, it's going to turn slightly left in order to establish exactly on that radial. And then that job is done. Okay, leveling off at 310. That's one of the few things that the plane actually does automatically. And then we can turn the flight director altitude hold mode on. And here we are. So, Yannick, where is the plane? Well, that's the question we're all, we're all asking ourselves. Um, it's scheduled for release today, but... Then again, just flight is in the UK, so I wouldn't be surprised if it releases towards the end of their working day. For us Germans, that is something around 6 or 7 p.m. maybe. Then, Barry, any way to calculate takeoff data as far as D-rate for runway length and condition? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the tables are there in the AFCOM, but if I'm honest with you, I'm not 100% happy with it quite yet. So, I need to get a bit... Um, I need to get a little bit more comfortable with them as well, because maybe we can have a look into this together. So, let's take out the uh, manual once more, and this is the um, flexible takeoff thrust section from the manual. It basically says, flex thrust is achieved by adjusting the thrust index setting for the limiting temperature at which the aircraft can safely take off from a particular runway at the existing weight, flap setting and wind conditions. The only problem I see with that 
is that we don't have data for existing runways and uh, flap settings. So we only have the thrust index tables. But as far as I can see, we need a little bit more data. Most specifically, we would need some um, data on how much runway it actually needs in order to be able to calculate that stuff uh, reliably. Without that data being available, I do not see how we can calculate a reduced thrust takeoff. But it is definitely something that I'm going to ask the guys over at Just Flight to see if they got something to uh, recommend there to uh, make those calculations possible. Okay, we're reaching our cruising Mach number, 0.7. You can see I dialed it in on the side over here, and we've actually went a little bit past that. So right now we're doing 0.72. I'll slow it down to 0.7. And here's something that many flight simulators tend to not know that becomes very relevant when flying aircraft in the conventional cockpit. You can see the airspeed indicator is rather little and therefore it is rather difficult to maintain a proper speed control. But here's what you can do. When you set your speed bug precisely to the speed you want to fly, like Mach 0.7 over here, then you've got this little fast slow indicator over here on the ADI. You can see I'm currently reducing my speed. You can barely see it on the speed indicator. But over here you can see the speed index coming down. And once that is located on the circle, I'm simply going to adjust the thrust so that we get an appropriate cruising speed. And that way you can also precisely fly your approach speeds, for example. So that is how you can do this kind of stuff and fly your airplane rather precisely, even though the speed indicator itself looks rather unprecise. So you can see, now we're getting right onto the marker. So I'm increasing thrust only very slightly. And that is all we need to do in order to maintain our speed over here. Easy going, isn't it? Obviously the airplane does not have an auto throttle, so we need to have a good look through the entire flight. But once your thrust is set, you typically don't need to do too many corrections. Usually those aircraft are built really well and are going to fly really well once your thrust is set appropriately. All right, then, let's have an, another quick look into the navigation. Because obviously I'm flying this one based on a VOR to VOR navigation. And the amount of VORs that are available in our... And the amount of VORs that are available in the European region, well, over the entire world, honestly, are getting less and less. Another problem that adds on to this is the range of VORs. In real life, the range of VORs typically is about 200 miles. However, it is not assured that they are indicating correctly outside a specific certified range that may be different for each VOR. There are obviously different norms about it, but it, it may not be assured that you actually have a proper signal outside that range. The problem is as follows. In the simulator, the VOR signal simply cuts off at that defined range, which often is somewhere in the region between 80 and 120 nautical miles. However, in real life, you can receive VORs very, very precisely up to 200 miles out when you're up at high cruising levels. And that makes the VOR navigation a little bit challenging. On top of that, of course, many procedures all over the world have turned on off nowadays, and indeed, when I flew my DC-6 around the world tour here in the simulator, over major parts of Asia I had significant navigation problems because there simply weren't any VORs at all anymore. So, that's a bit of a problem. But what can you do about it? Well, let's take a situation as we have right now. We're currently tracking outbound from a VOR. And we're 70 miles out now, and to be honest, I do not trust the simulator to give us a complete coverage until we intercept the next VOR. So what I'm expecting to happen is that at some point, I have no idea when, 
we are simply going to lose the signal of the VOR we're tracking outbound right now from one second to the other. In real life that wouldn't happen, in the simulator unfortunately it does. And even the Navigraph data does not correct that. So what we need to ensure is that we are stable on the selected radial outbound of that VOR by the time that the VOR cuts out. Because then wind changes are typically minor. You might start drifting a few degrees left and right, but even on a two or three hundred nautical mile lag, that isn't much of a problem. What is a problem is if you have not established your radial by the time you lose the VOR signal. So for that reason, try to establish the radial as quick as possible and try to use the beam mode to actually follow that radial because the beam mode is going to follow the radial with the highest possible accuracy. Therefore, by the time the one VOR cuts out, we are going to be on a nice track and by the time we start receiving the other VOR, we will then not have any problems getting onto that radial and tracking towards the new VOR. That is a little bit of a thing that we have to make up to help ourselves. Here it is, here it's just happened. Look at that, we've been tracking the VOR without any problems and all of a sudden it's just gone. That's not how it works in real life, that's just not how it works. But nonetheless, we know now that we are on a good track. So what I'm going to do is I'll now engage heading mode and I'll simply keep following this track until we eventually intercept the DME of the station that we're going towards. A little bit of mathematics maybe, the VOR cut out at approximately 80 nautical miles from the station and 80 miles is a distance that you will find a lot in Microsoft Flight Simulator. So at 80 miles a lot of VORs cut out, not realistic, but it happens. And what we can do now in order to increase our navigation accuracy is we do the following. We are going to open our en route charts and for that once again thank you to Navigraph for sponsoring those. Unfortunately the en route charts are not available on our tablet over here but they only have terminal charts which is a bit of a pity because en route charts would be really helpful on here. However since we don't have them on the um, just flight tablet quite yet what we can do is to use an external Navigraph application. For example, as I'm usually doing through my uh, browser tab on Sim Toolkit Pro like this. So, this is the sector that we're flying right now. Outbound Line of VOR towards Nuremberg VOR. We can see this is a track of 161 degrees, 171 nautical miles. We knew that we were 80 nautical miles out when we lost contact, so we have 90 miles to go to Nuremberg VOR. I, if we click onto the Nuremberg VOR we can get a little bit more information about that VOR down here. For example we might get information about the range of power. Over here it says this is just a low level VOR or low altitude VOR so I don't expect the range to be too much. Maybe somewhere in the region between you know 40 to 80 nautical miles. In some cases even just 25 nautical miles in the simulator which is much less than any VOR would have in real life but unfortunately um, that is the certified distance and in the sim they made that the maximum distance. So what we do is basically the following. We know we are established on this track. We know we've been 80 miles out by the time we lost the signal. So. We know that we've got 90 miles to fly to that um, station and we know our ground speed because we are obviously following our flight plan and obviously we could have checked that by the time where we still had reception but I missed to do that because we could have checked our ground speed over here and that would have been quite helpful to know now but we can always just have a look into the flight plan where it is also going to tell us the speed at which we expect it to fly so looking over here outbound our top of climb we're expected at 388 knots true airspeed giving us something around um, 458 knots ground speed actually no that is incorrect um, that is incorrect we are looking at uh, 414 true giving us a ground speed of 390 at a Mach number of 0 
We are flying Mark 0 0.70 over here, so we are flying roughly 390 knots. 390 knots equals roughly 6 nautical miles per minute. And with 90 miles to cover, that means we have 15 minutes to fly until we are over at Nuremberg VOR. So like that we can kind of expect when we are going to get reception towards our inbound station. And if those 15 minutes pass without receiving the inbound station, then I would start getting worried about my position. So, what can we do? Oh, Echo Gold Shitty Stanford is here. Hi, nice to see you, Metal Eye. Okay, um, what can we do then to verify our position nonetheless? Well, obviously, there are VORs around the area. So, for example, We've got Fulda VOR over here, which is almost halfway, and the frequency is 112.1. So, how about we simply dial that in to verify our position? So, we are navigating on VOR number 2, or we rather we were navigating on that. Our next VOR in use is going to be number 1, so let's set that active already. And then we can go ahead and select the um, number 2 station to the one that we expect to be nearby like so. And actually we are getting a DME and we are getting our bearing and with that we can basically pinpoint our location on the map as well. So that's just a little trick there that you can use to still find out your position even though our lovely simulator is going to quit out your VOR reception pretty much all the time. That's just something that we have to live with, taking into account that we simply did not have our... Uh, that we simply do not have so many en route VORs now anymore than there used to be in the 1960s when the uh, F-28 was really in its um, glorious days. In any case, you can still fly the airplane, even though not as precise, but then again we are navigating on VORs here, and we are not navigating to an RMP2 standard or whatsoever is uh, in use in real life in the Android airspace these days. So, fairly easy to go by, isn't it? So, as Walker, is there a real-world standard for distance you can be offset of a VOR airway equivalent to RMP10? Well, no, not really. Um, the thing is, the definition varies per airway. For example, most airways in Europe have a width of 5 nautical miles to either side. So those 5 miles, no problem. But in Africa, for example, there are airways which have a width of 100 nautical miles. So from that you can really see how big the differences are. And for that reason, well, I can't really give a general answer to your question there, I am afraid. In any case, we simply continue straight ahead until we start receiving Nuremberg VOR, and then we're going to use that for our continuous navigation. So a little bit further up, Marcus Grandman asked, Hi, do you ever fly an X-plane? There are some interesting aircraft not available yet in Microsoft Flight Simulator, including the Tolus A340, Hotstar Challenger 650 and XAG 737 which is soon releasing for X-plane 12. Well, X-plane is something that I'm on the brink of at the moment. Um, not as a replacement for Microsoft Flight Simulator, but for the simple fact that... Oh, here we go. Now we are receiving Nuremberg VOR. 40 miles out. So let's tune that in and B. Okay, now we're navigating towards Nuremberg and now I can continue with my story. So I am really thinking about getting X-Plane and the Tolis A340 at the moment because as nice as the Fenix Airbus is in MSFS, um, I want something that I can practice my A330 procedures on during my typewriting and the Fenix is simply not suitable for that. The Phoenix Airbus flies, well, it simply flies shit, I have to say it. Um, the manual flight characteristics of the thing are totally off the table. I've had my first couple of simulated sessions in the Airbus 330 now, and honestly, 
the airplane flies so incredibly nice. It really flies the same like any other aircraft, just that it is protected. So Airbus did such a good job. And then I'm flying the Phoenix, and the thing is a total garbage to manually fly. It really is. The pitch power values are off, the uh, hand flying characteristics are total garbage. I cannot accurately follow a glide slope with it. Um, I tell you honestly, Phoenix got great systems. Their system simulation is really good, but the flight characteristics that include the autopilot and the hand flying is just so off the table. I don't want to use that for anything relating to my type rating, because it is simply negative training. And for that reason I'm thinking about getting the Tolis A340 together with X-Plane 12 at the moment. However, the cost of that is um, really holding me off at the moment, because, well, it would be 60 bucks for X-Plane, 110 bucks for the A340, and then I have no sceneries and nothing. And, um, well, that is a bit of a concern for me, especially seeing that I looked at a couple of videos of the A340 and the graphics are just so utterly bad. I mean, it really looks like an FS2004 add-on, maybe an FSX add-on, to be uh, fair to it. So, yeah, um, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I'm not sure I'm willing to invest almost 200 bucks into getting X-Plane and the Tolis just, um, you know, just for, well, maybe being in for a disappointment because the graphics are so bad that I don't want to use it. That is my big concern at the moment. I know the screenshots on the product pages, they look really good, but then I'm just looking at YouTube videos and, well, well. Um, Regix, does the PNG then fly anything like a real 737? Well, kinda. Um, taking into account that my joystick at home has a totally different force than the uh, 737 yoke, at least the pitch and power values are somewhat accurate. There are some differences, like for example, when the airplane was developed, I sat there with the developers and we went over the flight model and I told them, well, in cruise, I need this pitch. On approach, I need this pitch. And then the developers told me, yeah, but MSFS doesn't make it possible to, to have both. We can either take a compromise between the two or we take one accurate and then the other is totally off. Like, for example, if we wanted a correct pitch on landing, it would mean that the attitude in cruise flight would be pretty much zero degrees nose up. And that's crap. So that's significant limitation of Microsoft Flight Simulator coming into place there. However, when I'm comparing the reaction of the airplane with the displacement of the control column in the virtual cockpit, then the 737 is actually quite good. I like that. I like that. Now, I am kind of tempted to try the Cebo 737 on X-Plane since there have been so many people saying so many good things about it. Um, but yeah, getting a separate simulator just for that, because I know that I wouldn't use X-Plane, you know, entirely. Um, that's something that I'm a little bit unsure about, if you know what I mean. In any case, let's quickly deal with our navigation. We are approaching Nuremberg VR, and here is something we need to take into account. The distance we see on the DME is so-called slant range. Slant range basically means that the distance from the airplane to the DME station is influenced by altitude, because this includes our 31,000 feet at which we are flying. Here's some easy mathematics. 6,000 feet equal one nautical mile. In other words, flying at 31,000 feet and knowing that Nuremberg Airport is located at roughly 1,000 feet, with 30,000 feet above the ground, divided by 6,000, gives me five nautical miles that we are above the DME. In other words, when this indicates 7 dME, we are more like 2 miles from the station. With that in mind, let's quickly check our flight plan, and we can see the next course is going to be 168 degrees. So let's go ahead and pre-select that. We've got a drift angle of roughly 10 degrees over here, and looking at a course of 168, well, we are lucky. We are flying 168 already, and that means we can fly straight past it. So we do not need to do any navigational exercises here, and we can simply continue straight ahead. 
So, five nautical miles, and you can see we enter the cone of silence as we are directly above the station. Where's the airport? Here it is. Overflying it perfectly. And now that we're outside of it again, I'm just gaining a little bit of distance from the station before I'm engaging the uh, beam mode so that the aircraft has a bit of time to stabilize because it is very hard to track an exact radial very close to the station. And since we're more or less going right on it anyway, we just continue straight ahead and that's it. At the same point in time, we can however already tune in my sub UR 15.2. We're navigating on the number one side, so let's tune 15.2 on the radio number two. We're not receiving it quite yet, so we are simply going to continue. And I believe we're far enough out now. Let's go into beam mode. The airplane is going to adjust itself on the radial, and that is it. Also, a very quick check there, overflying Nuremberg, we're supposed to have 3,400 kilograms of fuel on board our plane. And if we quickly go over here, we can see we right now have approximately 4,400. But remember how I uplifted some additional fuel. So, that looks alright to me. So, this is a distance 75 nautical miles towards Mysaf, so... It should really come in, I don't know, maybe at 40 miles. We don't quite know what our simulator is going to do there, but um, for sure it's going to have some interesting experiments waiting for us. Okay, um... Then Metal Eye, yes, agree. Phoenix is good to practice emergency procedures, that's it. Wait for an X plane sale. On the X Hawk store, the 340 costs $90, when on sale, 72 ish. Yeah, but to my knowledge, that is excluding taxes. So um, it will probably get a little bit more expensive. However, I'm probably going to give X plane a try over the course of the next couple of days and then see if I like it or not and um, then consider the A340. So, yeah. I don't know, maybe that is, uh, if only it wouldn't be that expensive, honestly. Um, I don't know, maybe I should start a Kickstarter campaign to uh, finance the A340, I don't know. Having been in uh, the Microsoft Flight Simulator world for the past three years, those excellent prices for add-ons are really uh, somewhat catching me. And Quoten Wagneriana, didn't the previous version of X-Plane come with a demo feature? Yes, it did, um, but obviously I still don't want to spend a hundred bucks on an airplane, which I'm then using on demo sim, if you know what I mean. So, Paquito Man, how is the system depth of the F-28 compared to the Just Flight BAE 146? Well, I basically haven't flown the 146, so I can't talk too much about that, but what I can talk about is all the systems that I've worked with in the F-28 so far are working quite well. Now, talking about working quite well, by the way, did anybody see this? The duct temperature for the flight deck is actually zero. So, we're probably freezing ourselves down here in the cockpit because stupid me forgot to turn on the uh, pack for the flight deck. And look at that. Pack coming on, working on it, and the duct temperature is going up. So, this somewhat leads me to a uh, system depth. Now, obviously system depth in an airplane like the uh, Fokker 28 is something different than system depth in a Boeing 737 or in any airplane equipped with an electronic flight instrument system. The entirety of the systems in the Fokker are probably less complex than the FMC of a 737 or let alone an Airbus alone. So, um... How is the system depth on the just flight? I tell you honestly, it is very good. It is doing what it is supposed to do. Um, so far, I didn't see anything that did not work as I would expect it to work. Now, obviously, the systems aren't that complex in the Fokker 28, but they did replicate 
exactly that. So let's play around with it a little bit. Let's play with the um, cabin temperatures. We've selected the authority for the cabin control, oh sorry, for the cabin temperature, to the cabin tube here with the uh, stewardess switch. So how about we go back into the cabin and then start playing with it once I settled on the navigation. So we are just receiving the next VOR. So let's go ahead and go to heading, switch around to map 2 and then track directly inbound to my south. Like so. Over to beam mode, here we go. Okay, so let's play around a little bit with the uh, cabin temperatures. Let's go back to the cabin. And first of all, I'm turning off that awful boarding music. I gotta reset that. Also, we can reset the pilot call that we did earlier on. So, let's turn the temperatures all the way up. This is maximum now. And let's have a look into the, into the cockpit and see if the cabin temperatures are actually going to change. This is obviously going to take a bit of time, but if you look closely, you can see the duct temperature is increasing here. Well, then our cabin temperatures are probably going to increase in a few moments as well. What we can also see, for example, is the influence of using anti-ice on the engines. So, look at the engine power right now. The N2 is set to about 89% at the moment, 89.3%. And also note the TGT around 360 degrees. Now I'm going to switch on the engine anti-ice. You can see the PSI of the air coming up over here. Now let's look at the engine instruments once again. You can see how it's actually lost a bit of um, power there, the engine, and it also went a little bit colder. Now when you're at lower levels, this is visible to a greater extent, but you can see how the influence is there. Now, by the way, if you're wondering why is it that the engines lose power when we turn on the anti-ice, well, that's quite easy. Bleed air is drawn from the low pressure section of the uh, compressor, and that bleed air is then used to heat up the engine cowls, and obviously, if you take away air, that has an influence on the performance. Right now it's off again and the engine power is up again and the temperatures have also changed again slightly. So this is the level of system depth that I can um, that I can really check out there. And Metal Eye, if you want any before purchasing, we can voice chat in the Discord with the stream in the A340. Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, let's meet after the stream if you want to, or at another point in time that's um, suitable for you. Then, Motoko, I'm tempted to purchase the F28, but part of me feels it would just be a stopgap until the Fokker 70 and 100 come out, and then it would be very likely not to get used much again. Well, I can understand your concerns, I can really understand them, but all I can tell you is this, the 28 really is a joy to fly as it, as it is over here. It is something totally different in terms of navigation and in terms of what we're doing with it from the um, other aircraft, so I don't know, I like it, I really like it. Um, obviously it ain't perfect. Well, it ain't perfect because it isn't an A330, but totally apart from that, it is a very nice and enjoyable plane to fly. And yeah, seeing that this probably is not going to be the cheapest of all add-ons, I can understand your concerns, but my recommendation is this. Take a look over my tutorial series, take a look over some other streamers as well. I heard that Flight to Sim and V1 simulations did some absolutely great streams on the Fokker already and I'm sure they are going to do some more in the future as well. So have a look over those and just gather the different material that you might be interested in. Also in the future I might do a video where I'm going to fly the airplane with the GPS inserted as we're flying it based on the um, conventional navigation of this one. Weather radar ain't working unfortunately. 
well, MSFS, you all know what that means. So yeah, just gather some um, data, have a look around the plane, and then you really need to um, decide on it. And that Derby, can it also do Arna? Um, you can install the GNS 530 in here, and then you can fly it Arna based on that. Okay, we are approaching the next VOR, which is Maisach, and we're going to leave that outbound on 179 degrees. So Maisach outbound 179. Okay, let's pre-select that. We are navigating on number 2, so let's go 179. And what we can do as well, right now we have a wind correction angle of roughly 7 degrees. So let's take 179 plus 7, it's going to be 186. So let's pre-select the heading bug to 186. And then just before we overfly the station, so pretty much now, six miles prior to it, remember five miles is where we are exactly over it. Go to heading select. I can select 179 on here. We'll overfly the station any moment now. Here we go, over the station. Now we'll wait a little bit until we're outside the cone of silence. Then we'll track a little bit outside of the um, VOR until we get a reliable reception that the airplane can actually reasonably follow. Like now you can see the radial slowly coming in. And when that is centered, I'm going back to the beam mode. But here's something. We need to note the time where we overflew this. So, where is my clock? Here it is. 48. So, the distance to the next waypoint is going to be 7, 11, 19, 21 minutes. Until Trento VOR. And at Trento, we have to start our descent already. About two miles prior to Trento, our top of descent is calculated, but we'll do a little bit of mental ar arithmetics in a moment in order to determine our descent rate manually. So let's quickly switch this over so that we can use our DME number two. Okay, so look at that. Ground speed, 400 knots. This is even increasing a tiny bit as we track outbound the station. So we're looking at roughly 400 knot ground speed here. Meaning that we cover roughly 7 nautical miles per minute. So based on that we can calculate what our ETA at the new waypoint is going to be. And then we can calculate our descent um, based on that. And Barry, VOR navigation is the way the plane was flown for the majority of its life. Yep, that's it. And as Walker, 2000 said TCAS and RVSM requirements, for example. Yeah, you aren't gonna fly this one based on. Um, you aren't gonna fly this one based on uh, RVSM, that's for sure. But then again, you can always fly below the RVSM airspace if you're taking it really. Um, if you're taking really precisely, so up to level 280 you can fly without RVSM. And then obviously um, you can select the TCAS VSI if you want to. If you go over here into the options, then we can put our TCAS VSI in here. And here you go, there you got your TCAS. The only thing you will not get in this airplane is an air data computer. Obviously we could put a GPS in the plane as well, we got the GPS navigation down here. So we could insert that as well if we wanted to be RNAV compliant. Personally, I really couldn't care less about being RNAV compliant in the Fokker 28, but I do certainly understand that some people want to fly this in a more modern environment and therefore this could be necessary. Okay, we're 20 miles out, slowly intercepting that radial. Remember what I said earlier, by 40 miles we're going to lose the um, station reception by that time we want to be sure we are well established exactly on the radio. So for that reason let's get a little bit more aggressive at um, intercepting that radio. Go another 5 degrees to the left in order to be sure that we go right on this. 
At the same point in time, let's go ahead and pre-select our Trento VOR in the radial. And someone's asking down there where we are flying. We are going towards Venice today. So we've got Trento 1535. Navigating on number two, that means number one goes to 1535. And here we are on the radial. Let's go to beam mode. Now the airplane is nicely catching on to it. So that is our navigation assured. So let's go ahead and start our approach preparation to at least think about it. Just one thing before we start with the approach preparation. There is one thing special on this airplane that I quickly want to talk about, and that is the autopilot and flight director systems, which are separate from one another. So, you've got the autopilot on the left side here, and you've got the flight director on the right side here, and one of them can do something totally different than the other. For example, if I select the pitch command of 10 degrees up on the flight director and turn off altitude hold, you'll see the flight director deviating all the way to the top. However, the autopilot is not going to follow that, because autopilot and flight director are not coupled. So, for that reason, you constantly have to, you constantly have to set them both independent from one another. Makes it interesting. It is the first time that I'm actually flying an airplane that um, behaves like this. Everything I've flown before always had the flight director and the autopilot coupled to one another. But well, something different, isn't it? Okay then, let's uh, quickly think about the approach. So we go to the charts and let's search, arrival. Takes a little while for this to connect at times, but here we go. So we are going to fly the Albert to Papa arrival since we are not armor compliant. And then if we have a look into the weather once more, we can see Venice. 110 at 7, slightly variable, cover of 30 degrees, 1015. So that points the runway 04 right, with a little bit of a crosswind, and maybe even a slight tailwind component. Maximum tailwind for the Fokker 28 is uh, 10 knots, so we are good to go like this. Okay, VOR Zulu, 04 right, is all armor. VOR Yankee, that is the conventional one, so this is the one we are going to take. Also need some taxi charts, obviously, so let's take the airport and let's take the parking stands. Cool. So, let's start with our Albert to Papa arrival. We are going to navigate towards Albert based on the uh, Trento VOR that we have tuned already, that we are heading to at the moment. Once we're inbound to Trento, we are... Oh, sorry, once we are out on Trento, we are going to... Um, determine the position to Albert based on the radial and the distance from Tanto. And then from Albert we join the radial 299 inbound to Chargia until 17.4 miles where we're going to start the left turn. Radial 218 inbound to Serra VOR towards Laren and from Laren we'll start the ILS Yankee approach for runway 04 right. Starting at 3000 feet and altitudes are a bit of a concern for our arrival. Because if we have a look into the radar minimum altitude chart, we can see that we've got some high terrain, well, the Alps, going up to 10,000 feet up here in the north. So we just lost the signal of um, MySat VOR, so we are now navigating purely on the... Um, we're now navigating purely on our heading, which I'll switch active now. And then I'll also switch around my radios expecting the signal of Trento VOR within the next 15 minutes. So let's go ahead and calculate a little bit of a descent profile. For the lazy people, there is a top of descent calculator down here. But we aren't going to do that. We will do things the same way how the Fokker 28 pilots had to do them in real life as well. So. First of all, some easy mathematics. We're in 31,000 feet, our destination field is sea level. 
So what does that mean? Well, we got to descend 31,000 feet. Now let's do some, let's take some notes over here. Like so. Okay, so 31 times three makes 93. Plus we will descend at a speed of 290 knots. And that means to intercept the ILS, we have to lose nine, uh, sorry, 90 knots. In level flight, we need one nautical mile per 10 knots. So in other words, we take the 93 we have, and we are going to add another nine nautical miles. Means we need 102 nautical miles to descend our airplane. So, can we write that somehow, please? No. Okay, it looks like I may be a little problem with this. Let's do it like this. So, 102 nautical miles is what we need to get down. So, let's calculate where our top of descent is going to be then. Well, we are going to start easy by looking into... Uh, we're going to start easy by looking into the approach chart. And now we basically just calculate backwards. So, based on the VOR, we know this is 25 miles. So basically, if we want to be on the conservative side, we'll just take the 17.4 DME from uh, Charger to be our 25 mile point. In other words, at this waypoint, we have 25 miles covered. 21 miles coming over until Albert, giving us a total of rounding this up to 22. So we have 47 miles covered by the time we're at Albert. So let's write that down. So 47 nautical miles from Albert means that before Albert, we have to start our descent 55 miles out. So 55 miles prior to Albert. Now let's have another look into our operational flight plan. And we'll see that from Trento towards Albert, it's a distance of 39 nautical miles. So 55 minus 39 is the distance in North Trento that we need. That is quite easy, isn't it? So 16 miles prior Trento, we have our top of descent. What did I say? 16. Sixteen DME from what the thing called again Trento, Tango November Tango. Okay, and that is our top of descent easily worked out. So from here onwards we can calculate a couple of altitudes a couple of altitudes that we want when we're crossing certain um, fixes. Let's start with the altitude that we want to have over Trento. 16 miles divided by 3 gives me something in the region of around um, 5,000 feet that we can lose. So TNT. We want to be at flight level it's at 310 minus 16, so 260. Next up, we can say Albert. We have 47 miles to run from Albert. So let's make the, let's calculate that the other way around to be sure that we're on the safe side here. 47 divided by 3 gives me something in the region of 15. A little bit less. Let's make it. Uh, let's actually make it 16. So flat level 160 by Albert. However, keep in mind the deceleration, so we subtract those 9 nautical miles, making it 
38 divided by 3 is something in the region of about 12, so let's say all that we want to be around flight level 120. And that is an easy calculation there, just a rough estimate that we can use later on in the descent. If we want to take it a bit more precise, then we can also say that at the 17.4 um, dB from Qi, where we have roughly 25 miles to run, we can say we have lost our speed by that point, so 25 miles divided by 3, once again, something around 7, so 7,000 feet by 17.4 dB Charlie Hotel India. And that should really cover us nicely. Okay, that is our descent basically prepared. So now we know how to how we want to descend the airplane. What else do we need to check before we actually start our descent? Well, cabin pressure, we'll have to select the target altitude down to the field elevation, which is going to be roughly zero. And then we got to keep in mind our landing performance. So we can already decide we're going to do a flap 42 landing. Give us 190 knots. Speed box are set. However, this also sets my yellow dot, which I don't quite like. So let's bring that back to the mark point seven over here, like so. Okay, and with that, we are basically fully prepared for our arrival into uh, Venice. Now, the funny thing, obviously, is going to be actually keeping the airplane under control and keeping it right on that path as we go down. And that is actually going to be the real challenge. Working out the um, mental mathematics is one thing, but actually being able to put it into action is quite the other. But first of all, we got to get, get there and then we can always um, start worrying about our uh, mental models. So, slowly seeing the end of the Alps and by the time we overfly the end of the Alps, we will pretty surely be um, just shy of our descent. If we have a look down at the map, unfortunately it does not include our flight plan. So if you loaded up a flight plan in MSFS, you would have it visible on the map over here. If you don't load up a flight plan in MSFS, then you will also not have it on the map. But still a nice little tool to have there, even though I would absolutely prefer to have the Navigraph annual chart over to this, but well, I absolutely hope they are going to add that soon. Okay, here we go. We are receiving our Trento VOR. So, let's head straight to it. Beam mode is active. And then we said we wanted to start the descent. 16 miles prior. We are now 21 miles prior to Trento. So, we are just about to start our descent already. Just before we do that, I'm quickly going uh, for a 30 second break and then I'll be straight with you again. Okay, back. So, heading in Mount Trento, 18 miles out. Let's set the target altitude down. I'll take something around flight level 150 at first. That is definitely going to keep us safe in this region of the Alps. And we are definitely still above them. Okay, 16 miles out. Change the pitch mode. Pitch it down using the uh, blue selector down there. Let's see, if we take 15.35 and enough 2, ground speed about 400 knots, so we're looking at roughly 2,000 feet a minute rate of descent. But 
but it's two and a half thousand, so a little bit less. Something like this. Okay, leaving cruise level. Fasten belts and no smoking signs are coming on. And as we're heading inbound to the station, we already got to ask ourselves, how are we going to leave the station? So let's have another quick look into the flight plan. And we can see we'll leave Trento on a 153. So, on the number 2, I'll please select the course to 153. Like so. Likewise, use the chance while it lasts to read the wind correction angle, which is roughly 5 degrees. So 153 plus 5 degrees right means 158. So I'm going to pre-select the heading bug to 158. So that when we enter the cone of silence, we can straight away switch to heading mode and intercept the new radial. In the meantime, 290 is going to be my target descent speed. And that is set, so now I can once again use my um, airspeed index over here. That's the um, landing gear warning horn. Obviously, we can simply um, mute that one. Okay, over at the cone of silence, heading mode. And then, when you start the descent, don't forget to turn the cabin pressure down to your destination. Pressure, pretty much like so. Okay, switch over to NAV2, where we've got the new radial already pre-selected. And here we go. Okay, again, we did not have too much of a range here for that, for this beacon, so we've got to intercept it quickly to make sure that we actually get onto the correct track. Otherwise, things are going to turn into a little bit of a guessing game here. And here it comes alive, that's good. Ice detected. Well, I doubt it. But welcome to Microsoft Flight Simulator. Okay, half scale deflection. And due to the limited range of the Trento VOR, I am going to turn it into beam mode now. The airplane is now going to nicely intercept it. 2,000 feet a minute rate of descent still looks good, and we have passed Trento about uh, two minutes ago, and we calculated flight level 260, and now in flight level 220 two minutes ago, so we passed it in 260, exactly as calculated. Good. So next up we can already um, time Albert, and for that let's have another look into the chart. And we need the charger radial 229 inbound. So charger 14.1. Take that active on the number one radio, 14.1. And we need 119 in the course. Okay, that's pre-selected, and we're actually receiving charger already. So what we can do now, by the time we leave the uh, reach of Trento VOR, we are simply going to continue on the heading until we intercept the uh, inbound track to Charger. Also we are becoming clear of the Alps now, so let's descend to our minimum en route altitude, which is going to be 5000 feet down there. Good. And that's 5,000 checks. What's the latest Q&H? 1015. So, set Q&H 1015. 
1015 cross check passing 19,400. Now. So, quick descent checks. The TTCs are in the takeoff mode. We can. Keep the engines where they are, the speeds are looking good, and the seatbelt signs are on, cabin pressure is under control, and the cabin is descending. Okay. That should be all we need. So, we lost the um, Trento Beacon. Let's switch over to a Georgia. And when this comes active, we are simply going to intercept it. I'll bet, let's see, 17.4 plus 21.6, so I'll bet is some 39 miles out from Georgia. So I'll bet is in roughly 10 nautical miles. Let's see, we want it to be at an altitude of flight level 120 over at I'll bet. 10 miles, we're flying 400 knots over the ground which equals roughly 6 miles a minute, so a bit less than a minute, so we'll be around flat level 140, a little bit deeper, make it 130, so we'll be roughly 1000 feet high. So let's go ahead and increase our rate of descent a little bit. Just to be sure that we get nicely back onto the profile. Radial is coming alive. What's pretty nice here, to determine the point where we need to turn left to intercept the radial, I've got my flight director set to localizer up here, and obviously I should set it to initiate the descent. So I've got the flight director set to localizer and to VOR. So the flight director tells me right now the plane wants to turn right in order to intercept. So if I would hit the beam button now, it would start a right hand turn. For that reason, I'm simply watching the flight director, and once it shows the wings level, I can press the beam button and the airplane is going to start a left hand turn in order to intercept the radial. That is one way of how you could navigate this. The other way is you fly it close to that beam over here and then you simply hit the button. But you can see how the flight director slowly starts a left hand turn here as well. So it is roughly wings level now. Let's go to the beam mode. And you can see the plane starts the left hand turn to intercept. Okay, so next up we have the 17.4 DME position where we want to be in 7000 feet. So that looks quite alright the way it currently is already. Let's pull the thrust off as we need to lose some speed now. 11,000 using the uh, pitch notes to pitch it up in order for the speed to start bleeding off. Target speed box set at 250 knots. Then we can do our 10,000 foot items. Lights on. Belts on. Cabin is coming down. Very well. So, next up is going to be our final turn. And that one is going to be based off the Tessera VOR 15.3. So let's go ahead and pre-select that. There we go, 15.3, pre-selected, 30 nautical miles out, 10,000 feet, that is just about perfect. And look at that, our speed is just passing 250 knots, pitching it down a little bit again. Ten thousand, checked. 
The next up will be 038 inbound Tessera. So let's please select 038 on the right course. Here we go, 038 pre-selected. So we said at 17.4 we want to be in 7,000. 17.4 is roughly 5 miles out. We are in 9,000 right now. So we are a tiny bit high, but then again we are a tiny bit slow as well, so I might pitch down a little bit more. And overall, our vertical profile is looking quite good. Let's pre-select the heading book, 038. So we intercept that on... Uh, well, you know what, I'm just going to pre-select 038 because the interceptor will probably be automatic anyway since we'll be so close to the radial. And Nick Kikuida, have I heard something about if and when it's coming to Xbox? It is coming to Xbox, but we don't know when. Okay, 17.4, heading select, switch over on map 2, and beam. So now the plane is intercepting it. 25 miles out, 7,000 feet, exactly as we planned it. And then from here we can switch to the ILS chart. The 109.95 into the other radio. 109.95 with a track of 038. Like so. Okay, 22 miles to run to the ILS. You know what, I'm taking this to heading mode for a second. Switch over to the localizer and here we go. There is our localizer. So a tiny bit to the left to capture that. Make it 030. Beam is armed. Okay, so we can now descend to an altitude of 3000, which is where we are going to catch Laren. Here we go, 3000 sets. So a little bit for the left. Okay, and we are now intercepting. We are just below the glide slope. So, localizer is captured. Also arming the glide slope mode. But I'm flying the airplane all the way down to 3000 feet now, keeping it below the glide at 250 knots, and then we'll simply let the speed come down. So, the lift dumpers are armed. Can check that over here as well. Lift dumper showing ready. One to go. Okay, coming in nicely. Rome heading is set and then we can quickly set the ILS frequency on the NAV2 radio as well. 10995. Both radios active for the approach. So 11 miles out, let's start reducing a bit of that speed. Now I'll show you how effective the speed brake is. Pulling this out and just watch the airspeed. Look at how quickly that is reducing. This is what it looks like from the outside. Okay, we are below 200 knots. 
let's take the first motor flaps. That is going to start stabilizing the plane a little bit. And then I'll just quickly click on the um, flap 42 one here once again. And that is going to select um, the speed bug down to the landing speed. 2500. Correct. So Kelt Gaming, um, you can get that recap after the landing when we're at the stand. So that is Venice coming up over here. Beautiful, isn't it? Okay, let's start doing some flying things again. A little bit more speed brake to lose some more of that speed. Passing 180. Passing 170. Gear down. Okay. Gear down. And flaps 11. Let's take over manually. Have a little bit of fun. Okay, if that's going into 42. Correct. Okay, looking good. So for the landing technique, we're going to fly it at um, the amber buck, which is VREF plus 10. And then at 100 feet, we will have to use our speed brake to bleed off the speed. That is how you do it in this aircraft. Interesting, isn't it? Certainly makes it more, certainly makes it more interesting. To me, at least. Okay, stable through the 500 foot gate. Reaching 100, speed brake coming out. 50, 40, 30, 90, 10. Come on, touch down. Here we are. So, lift dumper is out. And we are down. So, we will not take the first but the second exit. 80 knots, 70 knots, using a little bit of braking right now, and here we are. Nice, runway is vacated. Or rather, is being vacated. We'll take it all the way to the left, and then we'll start turning towards the terminal before we actually start our um, procedures. So, straight in a kilo. Come on, sharp. So up here we are, going on to Kilo, like so. Okay, and on Kilo, let's slow it down a little bit, and then we can start tidying it up. So, 
Jump light off, landing light off, flare lights off, and the taxi light on. Transponder can go to altitude off, your damper off, and the gas block comes on. Then flaps up, speed brakes up, weather radar, standby, and then on the overhead panel, flight directors going off. Engine anti ice off, pedo heat off, windshield heat off as needed. And finally, APU. Master on, one pack and go off already. We will take an outside stand today. I showed you the jetways on the way in. I'm going to show you the stairs. Oh, sorry, I showed you the jetway on the way out. I'm going to show you the stairs on the way in. So that should be 10 seconds over. Start the APU. And we'll take not this, but the next one. And here we are. Okay, plug and brake set. The APU is running, APU generator on, APU air on, and then engines. Off. Fuel pumps off. I'll give the engines a little bit time to run down. Transponder 2000 standby. And the overhead panel is basically all set up. Okay, so doors will be opened in a moment seatbelts going off and that's it welcome to venice so i'll just shut that boarding music off and they just put it straight on again okay looks like the company is uh insisting on that music okay and that is it ladies and gentlemen welcome to venice and i surely hope you enjoyed this little flight with the fokker 28 in my opinion an absolutely stunning little aircraft it is an absolute joy to fly and i can only recommend anyone to go and get it the moment it releases it's supposed to release today we'll see if that actually does and um, unfortunately, I do not have the time available for the return flight. I would absolutely love to do it, but I have a little bit of ABBA stuff to learn. However, maybe I can manage to get one more of the tutorials out today, which I surely hope to be the case. In any case, I'll have a little bit more complete um, update from my typewriting coming up very soon as well. But before we do that, let's quickly have a look into some of the... Um, Fokker 28 feedback from my side. So, graphics, superb. Frame rate, nothing to complain about. Outside model, superb. Inside model, superb. Sounds, very, very, very good. You can really see they recorded every single one of those switches on the real airplane. And that really shows the sounds absolutely shine in this aircraft. I can't overemphasize that. Flight model flies very good as well. It is a joy to fly. Very hard to slow down, which makes it for a challenge if you want to avoid having to use the speed brake. If you're happy using the speed brake, then, well, easy going. Um, it slows down very nicely with the speed brake. Okay, so that is pretty much it for the Fokker 28. System wise, nothing to complain about as you saw everything worked the way i expected it to work and that is still with a pre-release version that we've flown on this flight the price is going to be 65 euros plus your local sales tax bringing it into the region of somewhere around um bringing it into the region of somewhere around 75 euros unless hopefully that might change for a little bit for the release but to be fair, I do not quite expect that. 
In any case, I would like to thank you very much for flying with me today. Hope you enjoyed this one. And now, Sir Kelt Gaming, you asked me for a little update from my type rating. And there will be a more extensive video from that coming, but um, the quick version is I passed the theoretical exam of the A330 now, and I'm now in the simulator phase. That's the reason why I started doing these Fokker videos four days later than everybody else. The day they sent out the um, press copy, or the preview version, I actually um, had to go to the simulator center for four days of um, A330 simulator. In any case, Saturday I'm going next, and on Saturday I am starting another four-day season on the Airbus 330 full flight simulator. And I will do a more extensive video on uh, what exactly we're doing in there, well, afterwards. So that's a little update from that. We'll get a more extensive video over the course of the next couple of days or so, I do hope. And in the meantime, I would like to thank you very much for watching. Make sure to check the Fokker out, even though it might be a plane that you may not be 100% comfortable with. At first, it is very easy to learn. Like, listen, I came back the day before yesterday at 10 p.m. and didn't touch my computer that day. Yesterday, I started flying it, and after half a day, I could fly the airplane in an okay way. And now, I tend to say I can fly the airplane in a very good way. So... Take it from there. It is an easy airplane to learn. It is a challenge, though, especially if you're not too used to your raw data navigation. Now, certainly something worth checking out. And in the meantime, I'd just like to say thank you for watching. See you again in the next one. And as always, if you love what I'm doing, then leave a like, comment, and subscribe. And if you really, really love the channel, I would appreciate a small donation through the Buy Me Coffee link. Maybe with a certain purpose attached to it, like TOLIS A340. And um, in the meantime, thank you very much, and see you all again very, very soon.